Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So, Algorand. Let me tell you a few things about Algorand. First of all, it is an alternative blockchain. It's quite different from the traditional ones. Second of all, it's been uh, developed from scratch. Really, it's a totally new design. And by the way, I hope to convince you that it has been designed in such a way to enable continuous progress. So, we know blockchain and that's why we love it. They are bring us transparency, they are secure, they are distributed. They allow us to transact without a trusted party. So, we can agree that they are a dream infrastructure. On this, we agree. Where does the disagreement come from? How we implement it? And when we implement a blockchain, we need to implement two things. First of all, we have to build the chain so as to guarantee that no data can be altered and the order of blocks cannot be altered either. You know, that's a simple. That is 50 years ago technology. The real battle for is to choose over how to choose the next block. And so, the traditional approach, the first approach that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Nakamoto brought about is a uh, proof of work. And the main assumption is that the majority of the mining power is in honest hands. So what are the technical problems of proof of work? We already know, you know, that that's very high cost. So if you don't disregard the hidden inflation, hosting one transaction right now is about 20 bucks and it's going to go much, much higher. So you cannot use it to buy a pizza or something like that. Second of all, concentration of power. We talk about distributed blockchains, distributed blockchains, distributed blockchains. Well, in proof of work, the, the power is concentrated into the hands of three or even two miners. Is this distributed? No. Scalability. I mean, unless a blockchain scales, how can it be useful to the world? And a few transactional savings are not enough, and the world needs much more than that. Lack of finality. Okay, I'm happy. A payment to me appears in the latest block. But you know what? We are not sure that the latest block will remain in the blockchain. Very often, with a soft fork, blocks may disappear. Can we have a financial world in which a money transfer with some probability disappears? I don't think so. Long latency, okay, I hate when my block disappears, so I'm going to wait that my block is six deep from the border of a blockchain. Maybe 12 deep, okay? But now we are talking about hours rather than minutes. That is a very, very slow. And so if you take expensive and fast, I can understand. But if you take expensive and slow, it's hard to figure out why we want that. And finally, security. Well, is it secure? Well, not against hardware attack, not to work against network attack. It's secure against you know, mining and protocol attacks, but not against you know, network attacks. So if you see about this, at the end, the proof of work was the first idea. By the way, I agree with everybody that it's a great idea, but you know, we need a better than this. Okay, the next attempt has been the proof of stake. Proof of stake means a lot of things in one word. The, the most in, uh, traditional one is delegated proof of stake. What does it mean? Oh, in summary means, oh, for this month, these 20 good people are going to be in charge of designing the next block. Don't worry, because next month, different 20 people. Is this distributed? No. It's, at least it's honest, because they tell you everything is in the hands of 20 people. But these 20 people are going to have a big target, should be, should be, on their chest. Because if you never let alone corrupt these 20 people, assume they are honest and incorruptible, but you can always launch in seconds 
a denial of service attack against all 20 of them. And the blockchain grants to hold. I don't think that is a design we should aspire to. Now comes a bond and proof of stake. Oh, delegated is bad, bond and good. What does bond and proof of stake mean? Oh, it simply means that we allow 20, 200, 2,000, as many as they want, to put a lot of money in the middle of the table where they cannot touch it. And the people who voluntarily put money at stake in the middle of the table, they will be the one to decide the next block. And their influence is going to be proportional to the money that they put on the middle of the table. But is this fair? Let me ask you a fundamental question. The typical user, what fraction of his or her disposable income can afford to put in the middle of a table where he or she cannot touch it? And the answer is absolute, very, very small fraction. So in a system like this, not only we allow, but we, we even roll a big red card, enabling big thieves with deep pocket to put disproportional amount of money in the middle of the table for the sole purpose of controlling the blockchain. We can go on. All these things are proof of stake, but they are actually not truly distributed. There is a lot of hidden centralization. Some open, like in the delegated, some a bit more hidden, like in gold. So let me tell you a little bit about proof of stake, which is the whatever algorithm uh, puts forward. And what does it mean? First of all, we don't punish anybody. This notion that you can punish the bad guys makes us look good, feel good, but never works. So the fact that it's a fantasy that you expose to, you can find the bad guys and punish them. Never happens. It is a much better idea to design a system so you, that you make it impossible for the bad guys to, to work. And second of all, the system, pure proof, proof of stake, means that the money is always at your fingertips. It's not bonded, delegated in the middle of the table. It's in your wallet, where it should be. And provided that the majority of the money is in honest hands, the system is secure, period. When I say the majority of the money, I'm not, I don't mean the majority of the money of some people. I mean the majority of the money of all users. I don't mean all the money of some users. I mean all the money of all users. When you take them into account by margin, if this money is in honest hands, the system is not subverted. So in other words, more technically, where you say you want that each token has the same decision power. Not a token in the middle of the table, a token in your wallet still has the same decision power than any other token. And that is the ultimate distributed system. But you know what? To get there, you need to develop a lot of technology. I mean, blockchains cannot be a noble aspiration. It has to be a technology that back up these aspirations. Otherwise, we aspire, we aspire, we aspire, and we don't have enough. So let me give you algorithm summary. The main assumption, as I said, is that honest majority of money, meaning most of the money is in honest hand. By the way, I like this better than the previous assumption. Most of mining power is in honest hand. Why? Because with money, you can do anything. You can buy anything, including mining equipment. So if you have more money and you want to buy, more money and equipment, then you're going to have a dishonest majority of mining power. So that is a much lesser assumption. And let me tell you the technical advantages. First of all, computation is going to be trivial. Everybody can afford it, okay? And because we're going to do a few additional, a few comparisons, something like this. The system is truly decentralized because there is not two or three classes of users. There is one class of users, us, the people who have money in the system, nothing else, no exogenous trusted party, no miners, no nothing. Finality of payments. I mean, each block remains forever in the blockchain as soon as it appears. It's a little bit of a lie because 
There can be forks in Angola, but the forks are very rare. How rare? They can occur with probability 10 to the minus 18. 10 to the minus 18 is a strange concept. Of course it is, because I made it up. Let me tell you how I chose it. Assume you produce a block every second, which is pretty good. 10 to the power 18 happens to be the number of seconds from the Big Bang until now. In other words, yes, you can see a fork in Angola, but you have to wait for the lifetime of the universe. You know, and at, this, at this point, I can leave the probability of a fork. Scalability. Essentially, in Algora, you can produce a block as soon as you can propagate it around the world, around the network. But by the way, you need to propagate a block around the network because otherwise, you know, we don't have a distributed system. So, essentially means that theoretically is as fast as you can be. And security. You have a security against a, a very bad adversary who can coordinate large amounts of the, of the network and is secure against the protocol and the network attack. Because a blockchain will be attacked not only at the protocol level, but there are people cutting wires. There are going to be people reprogramming the gallows. A successful blockchain should have at least a trillion dollars in assets. Once you get at this amount of money, all kinds of attacks which they look expensive now are going to be very, very cheap to run. Let me tell you how Algorand works in action. Here is the first block, the Genesis block. By the way, agreeing on the Genesis block is easy because everybody knows the Genesis block is part of the specification of the system. Next to the Genesis block, there is a failure, a universal symbol of lightness and effortlessness. And as this failure gently falls to the ground, the blockchain unchained, unfolds. Okay? So you may ask, how about soft forks? How about proof of work? Guess what? There are no soft forks, and there are no proof of work. Right? You have a chain as it should be, as it was defined to be. One block after the other without changing your mind ever. How do we achieve this? We achieve it in two magic phases, where the magic is actually replaced by mathematics. So in magic phase one, by magic, a single user is selected among all users, proportionally to the amount of money he or she has in the system. And what does the selected user do? Proposes a new block and propagates a new block. That's the block I propose if I validate it. I look at all transactions that are valid, are not yet reflected in the blockchain, and I propagate it. End of phase one. Phase two, again, by magic, think of it like a thousand users are randomly selected among the set of all users, and what do they do? They reach agreement on the block proposed by the first user. And why? Because you see, in any society, if you want to be realistic, there are going to be bad actors, bad people. Maybe 1%, maybe 2%. If you live in a dangerous society, maybe 10%, maybe 20%. But they're not going to be in a majority. So when you choose at random a thousand people in a society that works, you know, absolutely that the majority of them, with overwhelming probability, is going to be honest. Even where 10% of the society is made by, by criminals, okay? So, once you see a block that has been proposed and has been signed off to be, I agree with it, by say 750 of these 1,000 people, you know that is the right next block. No need to change our mind. That's somehow how it works. By the way, for this uh, way of describing things, you are going to have a lot of questions. Legitimate questions. I counted at least 30 questions that I get every time that I speak about that. We have only time to uh, discuss one. Who selects the community? That's a good question. Because if I'm an adversary, I want to control the community who agrees on the block. 
And uh, the answer in Algorand is uh, very counterintuitive. Each committee member selects him or herself. What? That is a terrible idea. In fact, the best is the worst idea I can ever see. Right? Because if I'm bad and I can select myself, I select myself today, tomorrow, the day after, I want to be in charge of designing the next block every single day. But not so fast. Because to be selected, what does it mean? I must win my own individual fair cryptographic law that I run by myself in the privacy of my computer. And if I win, I obtain a winning ticket, meaning a proof that I can show to you and convince you that I'm part of this committee on this block. If, if I, you see a winning ticket for me, you pay attention to my opinion about the block, either up or down. Okay. The probability of winning by order is proportional to the amount of money I have in the system. Otherwise, I can clone myself a thousand silvios, and each one has a small probability of being part of the committee. I pack the committee. Not a good idea. Now, let me tell you that this is the ultimate speed. Because this lottery to decide which part of the committee takes a microsecond. So in one microsecond, a thousand people select themselves. That's fast. Now, let me tell you that this is the ultimate security. Why? Because if I'm a bad guy, I want to corrupt the committee. But whatever, as a problem, I don't know who is going to be in the committee. Should I corrupt you, you, you? I don't know. Because I don't know which one of you is going to win this lottery. But after you win the lottery and you propagate your winning ticket, in your opinion, up or down about the block, I know who you are and I can corrupt you. But hey, at that point, it's too late. Because your opinion is virally propagating across the network and I cannot put it back no more than a government can put back a message virally propagated by WikiLeaks. In sum, in algorithm there are no forks, no miners, no proof of work, Computation is trivial, the scalability is perfect, and transactions are fine. And there is a great security against protocol and network attack. And by the way, there are going to be a lot of other good properties. And in particular, I'd like to stop on the first one. Flexible governance without hard forms. Let me tell you what I mean. No human construct will work forever. To be human is to be changed. Life is about intelligent adaptation. And cryptocurrencies and blockchains right now are designed forever without changing the rules. This doesn't work. Nothing like this works in our life, right? So what we have here is a, a consensus problem, which is works like propose and agree, propose and agree, which is very flexible. And what do we agree on? Most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, on the next block. But we can actually agree also on a new change of rule, on a better rule, or on a new monetary policy. So that consensus not only let us agree on the block, but let us conduct and self-regulate ourselves in a very distributed and collaborative manner. Thank you.